I, I was in the uh, boardroom of the TD Tower when I was probably 24, 25. And again, I wasn't even really aware of what this meant. And I was in business with the chairman and president of the TD and another gentleman who was chairman of the board of the company I was doing. And I look back at that and I think, wow. Podcasting for the Art Gallery of Mississauga, this is Border Crossings, a podcast where we listen to stories and experiences from artists, innovators, community activators, and people living creative lives. I'm your host, Vasandra, and I can't wait to unpack the magic of border crossings with you. Are you curious about living a creative life fearlessly? Then hang tight for a dose of inspiration. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thank you. Good to be here. <laughs> How are you today? I'm very good. It's a beautiful day. So enjoying being outside most of the day. So lovely. That's nice. Um, so Steve, I know you, you're getting an opportunity to go outside, but I know that City Hall is still closed and the, and the art gallery of Mississauga in its physical form is still closed at this point in time. How do you feel about that? Well, I think it's a big loss. It's sad for, you know, we get 11,000 people go through the gallery and for lots of different reasons. And I think that losing that public space and access to art and just the place to go sometimes is, is a loss for lots of people. And it's sad because these things are very, you know, intangible, uh, but they have real meaning to lots of people and they're part of our lives and, and a very important part of our fabric. So, it's the way we express, the way we see things, the way we interpret. So That's true. That's true. And I know that uh, your team is working real hard and putting up online programming and uh, pretty much uh, taking the gallery through a digital transformation. I'm curious to know what your vision is uh, for this entire transformation that the gallery is um, undergoing at this point in time. Well, it's, as you know, it's, uh, it's, been something imposed upon us, but I think we're all going through a huge learning curve, like most uh, art facilities everywhere. If you look at every gallery anywhere in the world is having to make some type of transition. Here being a much smaller gallery, but I, we have different opportunities and we've got a really, I think, really, really energetic, creative team who are starting out on a journey together and learning and not afraid to take chances and some things are, are succeeding very well and some things are not so well, but they're enjoying it. And I love what, what I'm seeing so far. And I think um, I just, I've just got to keep going and keep pushing those boundaries, seeing how they can connect with different ideas, different programs. And, um, and let's keep going. It's early stages. I think we've got a really good team of people working on this. And uh, they're very open to like, creative ideas and sharing. Uh, and I think it's going to be a success. I think we're going to learn a lot. And I think it's also stage one of, mm -hmm. of a program. So it's, uh, it's not static. I think what's going to happen here, lot, where lots of people are going to learn how to evolve through this. And, uh, you know, what happens in times of crisis, people innovate. And you mm -hmm. find new ideas, new ways that even restaurants, for example, are going to survive. That's mm -hmm. the, that's the way life is. So. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that um, you're resilient about all of this, and you're not. Um, you're sort of um, open and responding and innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious to know why is community work and community engagement so important to you. I think, uh, again, it, uh, it flows back for me, I think, in many ways to how I grew up and the way I kind of came to Canada, or chatted about it at a different time. But I think it's this idea in the back of my mind that, that I think if you can expose, it doesn't just have to be children, but anybody to different ideas, different ways of looking at things, don't they all kind of become part of a fabric of weaving together how we can interpret and see each other. And I, I also like this idea that somewhere there are kids out there just by going to a gallery, get to see something really different, get to see 
perhaps things that they may never see in their normal everyday lives. And it, and it, and it triggers an idea, it triggers a desire, it triggers a learning experience for them. And out of that, something changes and something positive. So I think, you know, the whole basis for art in whatever form is about mm-hmm. expression and about sharing. And I think that's just a fantastic way for children to see things. So that's mm-hmm. one of the drivers for me in all of this. I can definitely relate to that. I've got to tell you, I do see uh, kids and folks who otherwise wouldn't walk into a gallery uh, environment. They feel welcome at the art gallery of Mississauga and then they feel like they're part of the community. So, yes, in many ways, it does sound relatable. I'm curious, though, Steve, um, I know you've been in the private Uh, private equity industry for the longest time, the finance industry for the longest time, you're incredibly accomplished when it comes to the uh, to the corporate environment. I know you've been a CEO when you were just barely 30. Um, There's a lot there. And I know that there's a story there. So I'm curious to listen to that story. What brought you into this world of uh, community development and art and um, what sort of uh, brought you to this side of the world? So the migration from London, England to here was I uh, was really just a happenstance. It was a, really just luck, good fortune, uh, or fortuna, as a, I guess the Romans would say. Two, two of my friends met two sisters who were vacationing in London when they were like 18 or 19. Mm-hmm. And the two sisters said, why don't you guys come and visit us? And my two friends said, you know, we're going to go to Toronto and would you like to come with us? So we came and came for nine weeks. Uh, Lots of stories about what happened to us then. But one of the most intriguing things for me was that growing up in London um, and London itself has always been somewhat multicultural mixed, although it's not as, not as multicultural as here, but I was used to being around kind of lots of different attitudes and music. And when I came here, it stunned me that I was got talking to a bus driver who was also from London. Mm-hmm. And I said to him, what, what, what do you think of it? Is this a good place? Is it a good life here? And this is at the tender age of 18. So I'm not even sure that you know what those questions mean. But mm-hmm. what shocked me was the bus driver saying to me, I'm taking flying lessons. And that was such a revealing statement to me. I thought, wow. There is no way in London you would find a bus driver taking flying lessons. So I found that just an amazing kind of comparison that that here was really, and it was in the 1970s, uh, mm-hmm. was just this amazing land of, of opportunity and the standard of living and wealth difference between here and England uh, was immense. It's closed a lot since then. Things have changed. But at the time, it just, this was such a, fantastic place to come and learn and, and get educated. And um, and I, I had no intention of staying in Canada. I just, I thought I'd come for a year. I would save some money. Um, one thing led to another and I never went back to England. So that's kind of the cornerstone of that story. There's a lot of inspiration hidden there because I, I know that uh, it, then from from being that teenager who's talking to the bus driver and sort of um, asking questions about life and things like that, uh, within a short span of about 12 years, I think you climbed um, to, uh, I don't know, insurmountable heights and you became a, uh, I, I want to think, um, one of the youngest um, uh, CEOs uh, in your time. I'm curious about how did you make this happen? You know, you know, artists and people who are living creative lives, we have so many barriers, we have so many borders. We always think that, oh, either we're too young or we're new to this country, we can't do it or, you know, things like that. It sounds to me like I'm sure you must have faced a lot of this in your time. I want to know what drove you, like what was your drive? What was your inspiration? How did you do it? First of all, I didn't know much. I didn't, I was completely, (laughs) I really did not. So ignorance is bliss sometimes and Mm -hmm. not having anything. So I had nothing to lose. And the other thing for me was I was here on my own. So I had no family here and nobody to depend on. So the only person 
that I could rely on or had to rely on was myself. And I just found real, it was, I just found being here, there were, there weren't the barriers that I think you find in places like London. Here it was based uh, very much on, did you have the ability? Could you, were you going to work really hard? Were you smart? Did you really, did you really want to push? And I was really fortunate that people didn't see my age as a barrier. They really looked at me as what I could do and how well I could do it. And I was just extremely driven. Um, and I didn't really have a specific goal in terms of thinking you know, I wanted to be this or I wanted to be that. I just really enjoyed what I did in business. And just I, I, I was involved, very fortunate to work for some great companies early on that taught me uh, so much. And then things just unfolded. I was I was open. I, I realized I, I was very good with numbers and really good, good at analyzing things. And I loved work. I really enjoyed it. So basically what happened, and I think it was a different economic structure then. This was before free trade. So there were a lot more head offices in Canada. And so, so climbing the ladder, if you want to put it that way, was a little bit easier, I suspect, uh, and a very different economy. We weren't in the knowledge-based economy back then. It was very much more manufacturing. And one thing led to another, and eventually I was a president of the Canadian public company, and then eventually went to the U.S. and lived in the U.S. for 12 years, running a very large organization. And then that led me into private equity. So in all those changes, for me, it was such a – everything I did was new. It was like a, it was like being a kid the whole time because I, I got to see all these places all over the world and see them in a very first-class way, meet all these people that if I had known much – I can tell you a quick story. I, I was in the uh, boardroom of the TD Tower when I was probably 24, 25. And again, I wasn't even really aware of what this meant. And I was in business with the chairman and president of the TD and another gentleman who was chairman of the board of the company I was doing. And I look back at that and I think, wow, you, you didn't even realize what you were doing. I mean, so again, um, I, I think just you really – Sometimes you just really keep pushing and you keep working. And I'm not sure you always have to have an absolute clear goal. It's more about are you really enjoying what you're doing? Are you really giving this everything you can? And I think I think there's a process that happens that like-minded people find like-minded people. If you're really uh, kind of got this drive and desire, then it will take you places. And sometimes things just happen. Um, so I, I really encourage everybody, and I think it goes back to this idea of young kids having opportunity and seeing things differently. Mm -hmm. I don't think it really matters what your background is. If you've got, there's lots of really successful people out there, you know, including you know, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and you know, lots of people, Frank Stronach, here who started Magna, who really just were very driven, very uh, had ideas and wanted to pursue ideas. And I think that tells you that you can, if you really are ambitious and you want to work hard, there's always throughout history been opportunity and mm -hmm. innovate. Innovation is key. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Steve. Um, something that you said just uh, struck me. Uh, that is, um, you know, you, you refer back to how um, it, for a younger mind, when you have an influence around you that's positive, sometimes that can be a turning point. Mm -hmm. So I want to know, can you take us back to something that was a turning point for you? One of the major turning points for me was when I was probably... Oh, I would have been 20, I think, at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I started at the very basic bottom level in, in a, a plastics manufacturing company that does all. They were based in Mississauga and all over the U.S. Anyway, I, they were a very well-run company. But I worked there for a couple of years, got promoted a number of times, learned a lot about different things. And then they came to me one day, I think I was 21, something like this. I said, listen, you really know lots about manufacturing. You really seem to enjoy that. We'd like you to run our industrial engineering department. And there's guys there that have got engineering degrees, 40, 45, P inches. Uh, but we think you can do this. And I, I, so I think that kind of idea was a turning point for me that 
as I, because they gave me this chance that I would never have thought of myself. But it also, throughout my career, I found lots of people who didn't necessarily have formal education, but I really thought they were very capable. And I found continuously, um, unless you're in a very highly specialized area, bright people, you can really, if you encourage and bring people along and build their self-belief, there's not many things that you can't do. You don't have to have, you know, a, a MBA or a PhD to do what we lots of people do in their day in and day out lives. And lots of things that we do are really about how do you engage with people? How do you manage people? How do you interact? How do you develop ideas? How do you make things better? How do you improve? So if you think, think about what we're transitioning through at the gallery now in terms of going back to your earlier question, mm-hmm. we really don't, there is no roadmap here. Mm-hmm. None of us really can say we know how we're going to do A, B, C, and, and D. But it's very reminiscent to me of, of the corporate world of saying, hey, listen, we've got four or five people here that are really bright open working together and they're going to come up with ideas and they're going to we're going to make this thing flow and everybody's going to get lots out of that in terms of their own personal enrichment but out of that we're also going to figure some things out and it can't come from people like me it has to come from that group because they're the innovators they're the they're the particularly there's a pretty young group of people, most of them, yourself included, that, you know, really, you know, you're going to lead this, you're going to lead. And that's, I think that's kind of that kind of turning point again, that says we, we're not sure, we don't have a precise blueprint, but we are confident enough together that we're going to find a way to, and, and I think it actually helps the gallery because being a small gallery for the size of our city and not having the resources to Poland. So if you kind of think about um, you know, Art Gallery of Hamilton is, I forget what it is, it's 70,000 square feet or 100,000 square feet. Museum of Contemporary Art that I know you like is, is, yes. is a huge, you know, huge X number of story building. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to compete with the AGO. So I think there's a turning point here for the gallery to really kind of um, really look inside of itself and say, hey, listen, given that, Maybe maybe this technology leap in conjunction with other things that we do, maybe that maybe we can overcome size. Maybe we can become something we can really carve out a we can carve out a niche that works for us. So it's true. I feel really excited, Steve. I, I must say thank you for the opportunity for me to be part of this uh, transition and this uh, transformation that the gallery is going through. Um, I'm curious here. Uh, about one thing. Um, I know that, uh, you know, you've been around the world, you've, um, and that too, the way you describe it, in a first class way, you've lived in so many different places. And then you made Mississauga your home. And now you're doing everything that you can to serve the community here. I want to know a few things that you feel are very special about the city, the city of Mississauga, and also what really keeps you going here to serve the community and to kind of just show up in one way or the other for the community? Uh, Well, the answer to the first question, if I think about some, I think Mississauga, the the way that um, they built out, they did do a pretty reasonable job of protecting most of the lakefront. So I think having access to the water is is very important. We live on, you know, Lake Ontario, which I think England fits into, I forget, <laughs> 50 <laughs> times or something silly. But, you know, having, we are, uh, we live on the lakes. So we, I think having access is important. And I think, you know, given the way this has been built out, uh, we've done a reasonable job in that. And even some of the trails that run a- along the Craddock River, where, the, again, we've kept that out of the hands of developers and we've mm-hmm. left it open and accessible. And again, I think we lose sight of that what that means to lots of people of all different age groups. Um, I, I can walk behind my house, go down into the valley at, at almost any time of the year and see lots of people of all different ages and all kinds of backgrounds 
fishing. You go on the trails on the Credit River, you can see people young, old, uh, you know, with babies, with dogs, and you kind of think, wow, what what is it makes, what, why, look at Central Park in New York, look at all the great parks in London. So we've done a reasonable job, and I think we really need to keep pushing. When you think about the, the development that's going on at Celebration Square, you know, are we really building enough green space for people to, to come and work and play? We use this uh, a coin a phrase from Richard Florida about, you know, Mississauga being a great place to work, live and play. And I think that kind of fits together with your second question in terms of um, I was involved in Rotary here for a long time. We did lots of stuff across the community and you see a need. You see lots of need out there that the mainstream media doesn't always pick up on. Mm -hmm. And and I think if you're going to if you if you're fortunate enough to have the time and the energy um, I don't think you can just be about you. I think if that doesn't kind of the sum of the parts doesn't work for me in terms of thinking, well, just we've got what we want, but isn't, isn't there more to life? And I think what you learned, particularly through my experience in Rotary was, you know, their motto is service above self. That so you get this, there's this tr tremendous feeling of you can't connect these dots, but you know that by doing and helping and giving, that somehow that gets paid back to you 10 times over. And you're not doing it consciously at all for that or unconsciously for those reasons, but that's how it is. So I kind of think you know, if you think about where we have come to and from with the gallery, and there's been lots of talk about do we do a gallery expansion and, and that may still happen. But you, again, you come back and say, listen, maybe, maybe what we've been through with this hardship of the virus and and the gallery has struggled, I think, over the last you know, few years financially, but we've got that on good solid footing now. But maybe maybe we just have to rethink, we reshape, we we have to be. We're not going to be all these other places uh, because we are Mississauga, and it's not it's not the same as as uh, Hamilton or Winnipeg or London or New York. So let's let's look at who we are and find some uh, joyful way to make that happen. Yeah, I, I hear you. I hear you when you say that Mississauga's got like its own special flavor. And as long as we are able to embrace it, we can enhance it and then share it with the community. That's a beautiful thought right there, Steve. Um, I Although I, I, like, I like your line, embrace and enhance. We just have to find <laughs> one more thing on that. So <laughs> it's a good, I like that. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks, Steve. Steve, I'm curious. Um, I know that you're... Um, you're incredibly encouraging when it comes to innovation and when it comes to shaping ideas. And as a leader, you're fairly inspiring. You're, I must say, fairly is an understatement. You're, right. you're really inspiring. So I want to know that uh, when it comes to the arts, are you drawn to something specific? Do you like anything special? Um, I think if I, I, I definitely like French Impressionist work. Um, mm -hmm. Um, but no, you know, I think one of the things art to me is a little bit like in some ways like music, I guess they're both art, but you know, you, you realize when you kind of let go of your ego, you mm -hmm. can just look at things and appreciate them through your own eyes. And, mm -hmm. and that's all this is. Everything I think you think about it, it's just your interpretation of something. So mm -hmm. I, I see lots of different things that, um, you know, the group of seven work, I think, is, is quite inspirational. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 if you looked on my walls, people say to me, wow, you know, you're, you've got all this art um, and it's bits and pieces from different places uh, of, and that just caught me in the moment. And I thought, you know, that, that image, I'm going to remember that image or that thought or that color. And um, so they don't, there's no cohesiveness to them. So I don't know what that says. So it's, it's uncanny that you brought up the group of seven. I am a huge fan of their work as well. Yeah. Um, is there anything in particular that you have seen that you have liked that stayed with you or that you feel like you go back to? Um, not really. You know, it took, the, the interesting thing, I, I've got some great encouragement. We talked about inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, through part of uh, our, my experience with the gallery, uh, the AGM, 
you know, I've been introduced to a couple of people that actually work, uh, been on the board of McMichael. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they've been incredibly generous with their time. And I've learned so much from them about, you know, they've got years of being on gallery boards. And, and, and one of the gentlemen actually started a thing called um, uh, Art for Cancer. He's actually, he's actually a plastic surgeon, but an art collector. And he, he said, listen, I realized I worked in all these institutions and they were dull. So he, he started a thing where he gets its friends uh, and, as, uh, and they get great works of arts and put them in oncology units and, and even in the Queensway here in Mississauga. And I find that just, I find also, again, you keep finding these other people out there that just you look at and go, wow, you know, what a great idea. Isn't that just generous of the guy's time? And, and they've been a tremendous help to me recently in terms of um, just – giving me insight into how a much larger uh, place like McMichael. And I'm actually, you know, somebody made this suggestion to me recently, and it's something we are we're certainly going to try and see if we can pursue it, is given that we're, we're quite small, you know, could we, could they, could we be a, uh, could they be our, our uh, patron, if you will, and maybe help us at the AGM by letting us have some of that art for a small <laughs> exhibit? But we'll see. So... So, right. but again, it's again that idea that you know you you get involved in things, mm -hmm. and it's amazing what flows back to you. Because if I wasn't involved in this, I would. There's two people that I'm absolutely uh, so uh, thrilled to have met who I would we would never have crossed paths if we weren't if I wasn't involved with the gallery. So that's mm -hmm. how it happens. What does success look like? for the art gallery of Mississauga in your eyes? Uh, just draw a picture for us here. I think it would be that it has a significant presence across a whole range of different uh, demographic groups, but it's something that people associate. When you kind of think about Mississauga, mm -hmm. do we really think about the art gallery? And I would say the answer today is, not as much as we should. So to me, it would be that it becomes a place, you know, again, within reason that you know, there's a sense of pride that we've got this gallery. There's a sense of pride that people are, are participating in it and they see this. So it's, it's, it has meaning to people. And I think when you have that, you get, you get a following, you get people that want to engage with you. And I think, again, this, this intersection we're at of, not just being a gallery that puts on exhibitions, but has this other wide range of activities going on, hopefully brings a much broader audience to the gallery and a much broader demographic. So that's, I think I've answered your question. I hope I have. Yeah, you want, you want the art gallery to become a destination driver. So hopefully someday people are like, I want to go to Mississauga because I want to visit the gallery. And that's success to you? Well, yeah, I, I think it's, um, if you, it isn't, if I think about all the years I've been in Mississauga, um, mm -hmm. and I spent lots of time at Celebration Square, I, mm -hmm. I don't know that it does, it's really hit a really large percentage of our population. And, mm -hmm. and if you think about it, as we've grown, then mm -hmm. has the gallery really grown in terms of its offerings and in terms of its, um, its reach? And I think there's been some, you know, this it's, it hasn't uh, it hasn't done a bad job, but I just think we're almost 800,000. How many people out there know we have an art gallery? How many people are, are, are understand that exists? I think when you get those penetration levels up, and you really, you know, you've got lots of people understanding and want to be there, want to come, want to participate, then I think you've really made a mark in the community, and that would be, I think, a real that would be a real achievement. Agreed. So, Steve, I know that the, we're hoping that the show is being received by artists, people, those who are living creative lives, and hopefully artists that are emerging from the city of Mississauga. Do you have a message for them that you would like to share? I think, again, we've talked a lot, uh, and I, I, I actually kind of, it's a great question in terms of the, the question before, because the other side to this is not just about participation from the general public or trying to reach, you know, kids and, and let them see something beyond 
what they see in their everyday lives. It's also, are we really, a, are we a really a forum? Are we really a place that is helping to develop local artists? You know, is that how they see us? We do the Visual Arts Mississauga. That's been going on, I think, for 30 odd years. But is it really, do they really feel that that's, that's really, they're really helping them? What role are we playing in the community with the artist community? So that's the other side of this coin that I, I'm glad you, you raised that question because I've, I've neglected to really bring that aspect into our conversation. And it's a very critical one that says, what can we help artists and can we launch people from here? And, and that's another whole part, I think, of the responsibility of the gallery. Yes, um, I'm glad that that's part of your vision. And I think that the city is, um, city city must be incredibly grateful for this as well. Um, Steve, I want uh, you to share two things with us today. One is your best or rather your most favorite memory of Mississauga mm -hmm. and your best or your most favorite memory of London, England? Hmm. Um, I think for me, I would give you a general answer to the uh, the Mississauga, Ontario question. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I, the, I always remember when I first came to Canada, the very first visit, somebody took me you know, up to cottage country and having grown up in central London, you know, I was just completely awestruck that, wow, first of all, people had these other places that they could go to and they had boats. And, but just the sheer scale of, of the landscape uh, and I, I, that always, I, you know, if you, you didn't grow up and see anything like this. And at that time in my life, I really hadn't traveled much. So I hadn't seen a lot, but this was so awesome. You think about the images, we go back to the group of seven in terms of how they, they do the lots of the landscapes and these massive rocks and water scenes, um, you know, that kind of stuff. And I think that also, I've always had a strong affinity to uh, being out on Lake Ontario, not a sailor, but I've always loved it when somebody's taking me out on a sailboat. And we used to do a day uh, in conjunction with the Port Credit Yacht Club. This was through Rotary. We would do an Easter Seals uh, sail day for kids who, uh, uh, their families and the kids who, um, who were part of the Easter Seals. So these were kids, you know, one of the kids would, would be, you know, uh, in a wheelchair, really, you know, obviously in uh, uh, lots of disabilities. And it was just such a joy to see the parents and these kids and all, all, all kinds of people coming out, volunteering, giving their boats, police officers, firefighters, taking these kids out, being out on the lake just for a day and just mm -hmm. seeing the smile on their face and their parents' face. So I think that's that, you know, there's a famous, um, uh, there's a famous line, I think, in some in Greek mythology, not Greek mythology, Greek philosophy, in mm -hmm. terms of the timeliness of things. And if you think about one, you're talking about group of seven images, or we think about beauty, for example, then, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of, it transcends generation, it transcends time. So that, that always struck with me. The second question was, I, remind me of the second question. Oh, yes. My second question is uh, that, your most favorite or precious memory from London, England? London, England. Um, London, let me just think quickly. Um, oh. oh. Take I, your time. It's fine. No, yeah. I'm just, I'm just, because I've been, but I, in recent years, I've spent a lot of time in London going back and seeing lots of places that, you know, I, I hadn't seen for years oh. as a kid. So um, I, I think London is a great place for walking. Uh, if you and like most cities, actually, Rome is the same, Paris is the same. So I love walking cities. I, I, I just love finding my way around. And I think sometimes if you do that early in the morning, you capture places. Um, so, you know, there's lots of parks in central London that are very beautiful. Um, I love going to sports. I love I love English football. So going to the stadiums, you know, as a young kid, I, yeah. I used to go. So all of those things are intertwined. I think for me, um, you know, I always my family is there, obviously, and also you know, I might parts of them live out in Windsor and Ascot. And you know, when you're going around there in these very narrow lanes, 
you could you're, you're, you could be hundreds of miles away from downtown London, but you're only 25 miles outside of London. So there's just it's a very un, I, I find England weird because it's such a small place, but you have all these unique places, and it's hard to figure out when you look at the land size we have here. And yet we in England, they've managed to carve out all these different like local dialects and local customs, obviously over a much longer period of time. So um, I haven't specifically asked you a question. I think there's just too many to give you one. <laughs> but I got to say, I, I found a common thread in both of these answers. That is, I can see that what stays with you, what seems to stay with you is um, things that are related to community. Things that are related to, I, I, I think I heard both the times I heard, you know, smiling faces. So I think, uh, Steve, the gallery is really blessed to have you there because you. Um, I, I know that uh, this is what happens. I've been a volunteer at the gallery. And when I see, you know, kids coming in, sometimes they're not from very well off backgrounds. They mm -hmm. probably just walk in and say, is this free? Do we have to pay something? And I'm like, no, nope, it's free. You can, you know, feel free to just come in and, you know, participate in whatever you like. Yeah. And I think um, I can see that this kind of um, impact really seems to drive you. So thank you so much for sharing this with us. Hopefully, thank you. <laughs> hopefully when we do this the next time, uh, you know, Post COVID, maybe a couple of years later, let's revisit this conversation. And uh, I'll ask you what's been your favorite post COVID memory. And I hope that the memory is also filled with, uh, you know, children and community with smiling faces. I look forward to that. I look forward to it too. And I, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of the time and energy you put into the gallery because if it wasn't for you and lots of like minded people, nothing we do would work. So I really am appreciative of you. So thank you. Thanks for joining us on this episode. This podcast is an extension of the Border Crossings Project, a community engaged arts project funded by the Ontario Trillium Foundation, the Ontario Arts Council and the City of Mississauga. Do you have a story to share with us? Are you living a creative life out there on your own? Well, I'm keen to hear from you. Write to me at agmconnect at mississauga.ca.